My title this evening is The Catholic Imagination in J.R.R. Tolkien and Flannery O'Connor. Pope Benedict XVI once said, Art and the saints are the greatest apologetics for our faith. I don't think it's too hard to see why this might be true. Traditionally, the three deepest experiences of human knowing are mystical, moral, and poetic. Mystical knowledge remains in the soul, tending towards silence, as the great 20th century Catholic and Thomistic philosopher Jacques Maritain once wrote. But moral knowledge expresses itself in a life, and poetic knowledge in a work. Things that others can reach out and touch and through them find their way back to the mysterious source of that knowledge and then back out again to the created world and its creator. Goodness and beauty, the gifts of artists and saints offer us in a special way an invitation to God himself. The church's 1992 catechism also recognizes the special role of the artist. Let me read a beautiful paragraph on artistic creativity, a paragraph that comes at the end of the Catechism's discussion of the Eighth Commandment, prohibiting lying. Art for Catholicism is inseparable from truth. Here's the passage. Created in the image of God, man also expresses the truth of his relationship with God the Creator by the beauty of his artistic works. Indeed, art is a distinctively human form of expression. Beyond the search for the necessities of life, which is common to all living creatures, art is a freely given superabundance of the human being's inner riches. To the extent that it is inspired by truth and love of beings, art bears a certain likeness to God's own activity in what he has created. Like any other human activity, art is not an absolute end in itself, but is ordered to and ennobled by the ultimate end of man. Artistic creativity, then, according to the church, is a participation in God's own creative activity, and so participates also in God as true and good and beautiful. A few years after the publication of the Catechism, Pope John Paul II wrote, a letter to artists, a beautiful reflection on the nature and purpose of artistic creativity. He says many wonderful things there, many of which echo and deepen the passage from the Catechism that I just read, and I recommend the entire letter, which is not that long, to those of you interested in Catholicism and art. But since my topic this evening is literature, let me read just a short paragraph that speaks to the Catholic literary imagination. The church has special need of those who can make perceptive and as far as possible attractive the world of the spirit, of the invisible, of God. On the literary and figurative level, using the endless possibilities of images and their symbolic force, Christ himself made extensive use of images in his preaching, fully in keeping with his willingness to become in the incarnation the icon of the unseen God. Literature has therefore a special place in the life of the church, for it shows us and invites us into the world of the spirit, of the invisible, and of God himself. The church's literary riches are immense, but this evening I want to think in some detail about two Catholic writers, J.R.R. Tolkien and Flannery O'Connor. Both wrote in the recent past, were devout Catholics, and embodied in very different ways the vision of Catholic literature expressed by Benedict and John Paul. I hope, too, that they might be at least somewhat familiar to all of you. Born in 1925 in Savannah, Georgia, to Irish Catholic parents from upper-class Southern families, Mary Flannery O'Connor was a quiet, intelligent, quick-witted, and rather contrary girl. A writer from a young age, she caused a minor family scandal at the age of 10 by a collection of satiric and uncomfortably close to life vignettes titled simply, My Relatives. It was in the naturalist vein, she wrote later, 
and was not well received. Shortly before her 16th birthday, her father died of lupus, the disease that would claim her own life in 1964 at the young age of 39. After attending the local women's college, she won a place at the Iowa Writers' Workshop, followed by a fellowship at Yadu, an artist's retreat in upstate New York. But after five years up north, lupus struck, and at the age of 25, she moved back to Milledgeville, Georgia, to live with her mother at Andalusia, the family dairy farm, where she would remain for the rest of her life. There at Andalusia, she would publish two novels and a generous handful of short stories infused by her Southern Catholic sensibility. She was already and would remain a daily communicant whenever possible. And with an eye for hard-edged and eternal spiritual truths. Accustomed to reading St. Thomas Aquinas each night before going to sleep, she wrote once to a friend that, if my mother were to come in during this process and say, turn off that light, it's late. I, with lifted finger and broad, bland, beatific expression, would reply, on the contrary, I answer that the light being external and limitless cannot be turned off. Shut your eyes. John Ronald Rule Tolkien was born in 1892 of English parents in South Africa. At the age of three, his mother brought him and his brother back to England to visit family. And his father, never in excellent health, died while they were away. His mother supported the two boys on a small income, taught them at home herself, and moved to the bucolic English countryside for the next four years. Four years, wrote Tolkien later, but the longest seeming and most formative part of my life. They inspired, among other things, the Shire of the Hobbits. At the end of this time, the small family converted to Catholicism. And after the death of his mother, when Tolkien was 12, he and his brother were adopted by one of Cardinal Newman's oratorians in Birmingham. A precocious young man who loved languages and myths and legends, Tolkien attended Oxford and studied English. His later essay on the old English poem Beowulf has become a classic. Married his teenage sweetheart and lived out his life rather quietly as an Oxford professor of English who intensely loved his Catholic faith, his wife and children, and his university work and who also managed to spend regular hours at night creating languages and mythical worlds and discussing them by day with his friends, such as C.S. Lewis. By the time of his death in 1973, Tolkien was an international celebrity, most famous, of course, for The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. His books, though deeply Catholic, inspired thousands of 1960s hippies. And it wasn't unusual at the time to find graffiti claiming Frodo lives, or Gandalf for president. <laughs> that one is making a comeback in the United States at the moment. Uh, his son Christopher, who passed away just a few weeks ago at the age of 95, was also an English professor and dedicated his life to editing and publishing his father's papers. And the Tolkien enthusiast now has access to an extraordinarily deep and magical world with its own mythology, heroes and villains, tragedies and triumphs. Both O'Connor and Tolkien fully express what I think is the most important feature of the Catholic literary imagination. When Tolkien was in the midst of writing The Lord of the Rings, he gave a lecture entitled On Fairy Stories. Tolkien's most important comments on the nature of his own creative writing and on Catholic fiction more broadly. At the end of this essay, Tolkien comes to the final characteristic of fairy stories, the consolation of the happy ending. Tragedy is the true form of drama, he says, its highest function. But the opposite is true of fairy stories. Since we do not appear to possess a word that expresses this opposite, I will call it eucatastrophe. The eucatastrophic tale is the true form of fairy tale and its highest function, 
Tolkien is here speaking of fairy stories in particular, but you catastrophe, the good catastrophe, the good disaster, is of much wider application than the otherworldly fantasy Tolkien was describing. I think it's the mark of Catholic literature as such. The consolation of fairy stories, says Tolkien, the joy of the happy ending, or more correctly, of the good catastrophe, the sudden joyous turn. It is a sudden and miraculous grace, never to be counted on to recur. It does not deny the existence of discatastrophe or sorrow and failure, says Tolkien. The possibility of these is necessary to the joy of deliverance. It denies, in the face of much evidence, if you will, universal final defeat, and insofar is evangelium, good news, giving a fleeting glimpse of joy, joy beyond the walls of the world. Tolkien's reference here to evangelium is not accidental. As he says later, the you catastrophe we see in a brief vision may be a far off gleam or echo of evangelium in the real world. The Gospels contain a fairy story, and the greatest and most complete conceivable eucatastrophe. The joy of eucatastrophe is the precious joy that satisfies hope, and Catholic literature is, above all, hopeful. This doesn't mean that a Catholic story must end happily ever after. As O'Connor's fiction shows, a Catholic story may be very grim indeed. But whatever tragic circumstances befall the characters, whatever pain and sorrow they must endure, the conclusion of a Catholic story, if it does not clearly end in joy, at least leaves open the possibility of joy. As Tolkien says, it denies, in the face of much evidence, if you will, universal final defeat. No suffering can extinguish every opportunity for redemption, not even most of all, the cruel jaws of death itself. We would be hard pressed to find a more pure expression of eucatastrophe than Flannery O'Connor's novels and stories. Dark as they seem, full of murders and sneering children and trickster vagabonds, her fiction is nonetheless profoundly Catholic, most of all, because it is so hopeful. Despite the bloodshed, all of them end with a eucatastrophe. And so all of them have, dare I say it to those who have read these stories before, happy endings. Let's have a particular story before us. The river. Have any of you read The River? You should go home this evening and read The River. The River, an early story, first published in 1953, when O'Connor was 28. It's one of two stories that end with a child's accidental suicide. The plot of the river is straightforward. Harry Ashfield, a boy four or five years old, is picked up Sunday morning from his house by Mrs. Conan, his babysitter for the day. She takes him to her house, a half mile walk from the end of the town's streetcar line, where her three boys trick him into letting out a pig who chases Harry, terrified, back to the house. Later that afternoon, Mrs. Conan takes Harry and her children down to the river, where an itinerant preacher is speaking to a small crowd. Listen to what I got to say, you people, he says. There ain't but one river, and that's the river of life made out of Jesus' blood. That's the river you have to lay your pain in, in the river of faith, in the river of life, in the river of love, in the rich red river of Jesus' blood, you people. It's a river full of pain itself, pain itself moving toward the kingdom of Christ to be washed away. Slow, you people. Slow as this here old red water river round my feet. Mrs. Conan suddenly brings Harry to the front and presents him for baptism. Harry is thrust under the water and emerges spluttering while the preacher says, You count now. You didn't even count before. When Mrs. Conan brings Harry home, his parents are in the middle of another evening party. When the preacher asks Harry about his mother's sickness so he could call on Jesus to heal her, Harry innocently replied, well, she has a hangover. 
Harry's mother eventually comes in to say goodnight in order to ask what lies he'd been telling today. The next morning, Harry wakes up late and wanders around the apartment, eating odds and ends. Bored, he calculates that his parents will get up after one in the afternoon. Suddenly, he leaves the house, takes the streetcar out of town, and returns to the river, where he wades in and, after a few unsuccessful tries, drowns himself. For an instant, O'Connor writes, he was overcome with surprise. Then, since he was moving quickly and knew that he was getting somewhere, all his fury and his fear left him. We could dull the sharp edge of this story by treating it as an allegory. O'Connor is clearly thinking about the way that baptism works, and especially the Catholic doctrine of baptism of desire. The story is full of images of death and the devil. Three times Mrs. Conan is called a skeleton, first a speckled skeleton, then a musical skeleton, and finally a woman who stares with a skeleton's appearance of seeing everything. And when Mrs. Conan, her children, and Harry make their way to the river, they look like the skeleton of an old boat. The preacher has a face all bone and red light reflected from the river. The pig that chases Harry seems merely a malicious trick until we find a few pages later that Mrs. Conan reads to Harry from an old children's book, The Life of Jesus Christ for Readers Under Twelve. It was full of pictures, O'Connor writes, one of a carpenter driving a crowd of pigs out of a man. They were real pigs, gray and sour looking. Gray and sour. Two words that pick up the description of the Conan's all too real pig who nosed its gray, wet and sour face into Harry's. And as Harry is drowning himself, he sees the skeptic from yesterday's crowd, Mr. Paradise, bounding after him like a giant pig and shouting, trying, of course, to save him from the river. The first piece of dialogue we get is the claim that Harry ain't fixed right. His arm is hung up in the sleeve of his coat. Well then, for Christ's sake, fix him, is the father's reply. An oath repeated later, when after Mrs. Conan announces to Harry's mother that the preacher prayed for her to be healed, she replies, healed? Healed of what, for Christ's sake? And his father says farewell that first morning by saying, Goodbye, old man. Perhaps a reference to the old man Adam of the Apostle Paul, who says in Colossians, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his practices and have put on the new man who is being renewed in knowledge after the image of his creator. Harry himself is described as mute and patient, like an old sheep waiting to be let out. And he tricks Mrs. Conan into calling him by a new name, the name with which the preacher baptizes him. So we can ease the pain and shock of this story of a neglected little boy who accidentally drowns himself by reading the story as a dramatization in the trappings of the American South of the mystery of baptism. And the symbolism is no doubt there. But we fail to do O'Connor justice if we take such an easy way out. If the story is any good, it has to work on a literal level as well as a symbolic one. I find that readers sometimes react to this story on a literal level with something approaching horror. That is, the story must be a tragedy and describes some of the many ways we can fail our children. But, and I fear I've not conveyed this at all, the story is without a doubt a comedy and not a tragedy. Who can resist the humor of Mrs. Conan's disdain for an abstract painting she sees on the wall of Harry's house? I wouldn't have paid for that, she says, nodding at the painting. I would have drew it myself. And then a few paragraphs later, she gives the watercolor another look and concludes, I wouldn't have drew it. This story is a comedy not just in the details, though its details are funny, but as a whole, for it ends happily, doesn't it? If we take Catholicism seriously, then little Harry makes his way to heaven by the last page. <laughs>
Of course, we can respond that a little boy isn't supposed to get to heaven that way. Harry is ignorant, no doubt, and takes what the preacher says at face value and doesn't see that he's drowning himself. So we can't think of him as committing the sin of self-destruction. But wouldn't things have been better had they turned out differently? I suppose that must be true. Had his parents loved him properly, or if he had understood more of the world and the way Jesus wants to save us, he wouldn't have thought that the way to, G to Jesus was downriver. There are all sorts of ways of imagining a better life and death for Harry. But what about the Harry that we see in this story, this particular little boy who might at any time be smitten by God's providence, struck by lightning, run over, overcome by illness, killed by any number of things that bring down thousands of people the world over every day? How exactly is this particular boy's death a tragedy for him? Assuming, of course, that the Catholic religion is a true one and that we should not expect Harry to be anywhere else than surely with Jesus that very day in paradise. You catastrophe indeed. O'Connor's stories abound with this kind of ending. Hazel Motes, the protagonist of her first novel, Wise Blood, dies of exposure followed by a blow to the head, but only at the conclusion of a lengthy spiritual purification. Ruby Hill, in a stroke of good fortune, comes to the slow and terrifying realization that she is pregnant. But the reader is left with the clear impression that pregnancy is the best thing that ever happened to her. Three young arsonists set alight Mrs. Cope's woods in the conclusion to a circle in the fire, and that seems the only thing that could possibly shake Mrs. Cope out of her spiritual complacency. And even though Mrs. May ends Greenleaf, gored to death by a bull, she dies with the look of a person whose sight has been suddenly restored, but who finds the light unbearable. As bent over the bull, she appears to whisper some last discovery into the animal's ear. The story is, among other things, a rewriting of Francis Thompson's The Hound of Heaven. I have been describing O'Connor's stories as eucatastrophic, hopeful in the Christian eschatological sense. Each one ended in some fashion by a fierce encounter with God's grace. O'Connor's characters are broken, sinful people, but she loves them nonetheless, and she always offers them the chance of salvation. Here is how she herself explains the hard, unyielding texture of her stories. Everyone needs, of course, to be lifted up. There is something in us as storytellers and as listeners to stories that demands the redemptive act, that demands that what falls at least be offered the chance to be restored. The reader of today looks for this motion, and rightly so, but what he has forgotten is the cost of it, she says. His sense of evil is deluded or lacking altogether, and so he's forgotten the price of restoration. There are ages when it is possible to woo the reader, there are others when something more drastic is necessary. O'Connor wrote as she did, if we take this paragraph seriously, because as a Catholic she needed to write hopeful fiction, fiction that held out at least the possibility of redemption. But to make such spiritual realities visible in stories that would work for her readers, she needed the tools of distortion, tools that resulted in fiction that is wild, violent and comic. I've been speaking about Flannery O'Connor's stories as compelling, even pure examples of hopeful, eucatastrophic Catholic fiction. But O'Connor's explanation of the importance of the grotesque in her stories, the absence of wooing, and the focus on pain and one's preparation for death, will help me explain two other important characteristics of Catholic literature. Characteristics that are in a certain amount of conflict with one another. Tolkien's description of you catastrophe appears in the concluding pages of On Fairy Stories. At the very beginning of that essay, Tolkien remarks that it is man who is in contrast to fairies supernatural and often of diminutive stature, whereas they are natural, far more natural than he such is their doom. 
The road to fairyland is not the road to heaven, nor even to hell, I believe, though some have held that it may lead thither indirectly by the devil's tithe. There is something for Tolkien non-eternal for good or ill about fairyland, as if fairyland is about fairyland and not some other thing. O'Connor wants to pull into focus all the supernatural things tied to the everyday world of our senses. Heaven and hell, angels and demons, sin and grace. Fairyland, by contrast, is content just with itself. Tolkien, for example, clearly loved the magical, the enchanted, the fantastic, and the adventurous. If I could risk an extension of his vocabulary, I would say that he loved the pagan. By pagan, I don't mean ancient polythe polytheistic religion. I mean instead all of creation insofar as it dwells within itself, rejoicing in its glorious splendor, even though aware of its own mysterious imperfection. But don't think here Tolkien is somehow preferring the specifically pagan to the Christian. Here's Tolkien. For it is true that only the Christians have made Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love, utterly beautiful, a wonder for the soul. The Christian poets have fashioned nymphs and dryads of which not even Greece ever dreamt. For Tolkien, the true Catholic can outpagan the pagans. How so? By celebrating the exquisitely bittersweet beauty of everything around us in all its transient glory. Catholics have the fullest possible appreciation of the splendor of the natural world because we know that God deigned to join it to himself in the person of his son. The beauty of the sensuous, its tastes and textures, the songs of birds, the blues of the sky, the moist pungency of freshly turned earth. Even though Catholics celebrate them even more than any pagan could, knowing that they come from God, just because they do come from God, they are worth joyfully celebrating, joyfully experiencing in their own right as things in themselves. I think this is the kind of joy Tolkien takes in the natural world and that he tries to create anew in his invented worlds. Although Tolkien is best known for hobbits and rings, I want to retell you a lesser known short story of his entitled Leaf by Niggle, and again written in the midst of his work on the Lord of the Rings to show you what Tolkien is thinking about. Niggle is a little man who had a long journey to make, but he did not want to go, and he put off his preparations. He was also a painter, though not a very good one. One picture in particular eventually captured all his attention. It had begun with a leaf caught in the wind, and it became a tree. Then all round the tree and behind it, through the gaps in the leaves and boughs, a country began to open out. And there were glimpses of a forest marching over the land and of mountains tipped with snow. Niggle lost interest in his other pictures. And his canvas for this picture grew so that he needed a ladder to reach the top portions. When neighbors called, he was polite, but underneath he was always thinking of his painting. As time went on, his garden became neglected, and Niggle's time became even more precious as his troublesome journey grew closer. One day, his neighbor Parrish knocked and begged Niggle to go to town for the doctor for his sick wife, he himself being unable to go because of his lame leg. Niggle went, cursing under his breath, and fetched the doctor in the middle of a storm. Parrish's wife, of course, turned out not sick at all. Parrish and his wife were accustomed to ask many favors of Niggle for the sake of their own convenience. But Niggle caught a terrible cold and hadn't yet recovered before the driver came to take him on his long-awaited journey. After some years in a hospital where he was made to do various jobs, and which eventually he did very well, he was sent not back home, but instead to somewhere new, out in the country. Upon arrival, he falls off his bicycle, for before him stands the tree. 
his tree, real and finished. If you could say that of a tree that was alive, its leaves opening, its branches growing and bending in the wind that Niggle had so often felt or guessed and had so often failed to catch. He gazed at the tree and slowly he lifted his arms and opened them wide. It's a gift, he said. He was referring to his art and also to the results, but he was using the word quite literally. After some time improving the land, Parrish himself joins him at his tree. Niggle's picture, says Parrish in astonishment. Did you think of all this, Niggle? I never knew you were so clever. Why didn't you tell me? Another man says, he tried to tell you long ago, but you would not look. He had only got canvas and paint in those days, and you wanted to mend your roof with them. This is what you and your wife used to call Niggle's nonsense, or that daubing. But it did not look like this then, not real, says Parrish. No, it was only a glimpse then, says the man. But you might have caught the glimpse if you had ever thought it worthwhile to try. And then Niggle departs again, this time leaving his tree for the mountains. He was going to learn about sheep, the story continues, and the high pasturages, and look at a wider sky, and walk ever further and further towards the mountains, always uphill. Even little Niggle in his old home could glimpse the mountains far away, and they got into the borders of his picture. But what they are really like and what lies beyond them, only those can say who have climbed them. Some time later, there is a conversation held about Niggle's country. It's proving very useful indeed as a holiday and a refreshment. It's splendid for convalescence, and not only for that, for many it is the best introduction to the mountains. It works wonders in some cases. I'm sending more and more there, and they seldom have to come back. I hope the theme of co-creation with God is clear enough in this story. Nichols' painting is, in a way, Tolkien's own mythological world, of which the Lord of the Rings is only a small part. And by inventing his tree and its country, Nigel continues in his own way the divine creative activity of God himself. What makes this story so thoughtful, though, is the way Nigel's painting is taken up into the eternal. I can't help but assume that Nigel's journey after he catches cold, with the driver to the hospital, is his death. And his long work afterwards at various odd jobs in the hospital, a kind of purgatory. His time then in the countryside, in the company of his completed tree, after he leaves the hospital, is curious. I myself think it is the beginning of heaven, the foothills, so to speak, before the divinity proper of the mountains at the end of the story. Tolkien is suggesting that the artist, the sub-creator, is adding to creation, and as such is contributing to heaven itself. We would be hard-pressed to find a more powerful affirmation of the created world, in this case the created world of the artist. For Niggle's painting is good in itself and worth spending time on, and so good, in fact, that it gets taken up into eternity. If I could hazard a one-word name for the kind of hopeful Catholic writing Tolkien gave us, I would call it incarnational. That is, it has a special appreciation for the created world, the things that are not God, though they are of God. The incarnational is not completely absent in Flannery O'Connor's writing, but she is principally interested in something else. Instead of incarnational stories, she always makes us see the inadequacy of the natural world, its impoverishment in contrast with the divine. While we are alive on this earth, we will suffer, for we are a pilgrim people, and we should not expect real joy before we die and rise again.
On the contrary, like the early martyrs, should we not rather yearn to die, especially to die for Jesus? Is it not dangerous to linger over the good things of the earth? This place is not our true home, and its fruits will never satisfy us. Consider the river again, and the language O'Connor uses to describe her characters and their world. I've already mentioned the gray and sour pigs, as well as the skeletal appearance of Mrs. Conan, the preacher, and the line of figures walking to the river. Here's how she describes the sun, an important character in almost all of her fiction. First appears the gray morning. Later, the white Sunday sun, climbing fast through a scum of gray clouds as if it meant to overtake them. Later, it is rolling away ahead of them. When Harry is at the river, he sees the pieces of the white sun scattered in the river. And later, the air was so quiet he could hear the broken pieces of the sun knocking in the water. The next morning, the sun came in palely, stained gray by the glass. Finally, on his way to the river for the last time, the sun was pale yellow and high and hot. The words lined up alongside sun include pieces, scattered, stained, glass, pale, and so on. Words that clearly convey the omnipresent and penetrating power of the sun rather than its gentle beauty. The human characters, for their part, are glum and limp, looming, toneless, or jaunty, with collapsed mouths. They glance severely with eyes still and gray as glass and stern faces. The most common word describing speech besides he or she said is muttered. No one ever smiles, though now and again someone refrains from smiling, like the three boys who looked at Harry silently, not smiling. Instead, people grin, a word with many more layers of complexity than the word smile. Grin comes from the Old English, grenian, meaning to bear the teeth in pain or anger, and is probably related to the word groan. Curiously, it's also cognate with the old high German grenen, to mutter. I like to think O'Connor might have had this in mind. The tension O'Connor builds into this story by means of her vocabulary is so powerful that the reader, like Harry himself, feels the release of the final paragraph where the language smooths out. The waiting current caught him like a long, gentle hand and pulled him swiftly forward and down. For an instant, he was overcome with surprise. Then since he was moving quickly and knew that he was getting somewhere, all his fury and his fear left him. If we are absorbed in this story as fully as its author must have intended, then we should feel the same way. We are leaving this world behind. And thank goodness, it's quite simply, I think, impossible to imagine Tolkien's Middle Earth described in this way. O'Connor's stories are powerful in large part because they force us to confront our eternal destiny and to remember how little everything else matters in comparison. God's grace in her world is just like that long, gentle hand, pulling, always pulling us down and through this world and into the next. O'Connor's prophetic voice cries out to us from the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. Her writing demands that we take our life seriously as a journey towards death and judgment. And as the preacher says to Mr. Paradise, glancing towards him with a raised fist, believe Jesus or the devil, testify to one or the other. Tolkien, on the other hand, writes to woo us like a lover offering the beauty and joy of his creation. It's true that these creations reflect supernatural, divine realities. They too can be, or surely meant to be, means of ascent to beauty itself, as is Nigel's picture, taken up into the fabric of heaven. But they can work in this way only if they themselves really are beautiful, and so really are worth lingering over for their own sakes. They can be means of grace only insofar as they are also, at least potentially, distractions from our onward journey. 
There is a reason, after all, that Tolkien's fiction found its way onto the shelves of the hippies, and O'Connor's didn't. O'Connor sacrifices, we might say, the soft, the musical, in her writing, in exchange for the hardness of prophecy. She famously claimed to have the original tin ear. All I can say about it, she wrote to her friend Betty Hester, is that all classical music sounds alike to me, and all the rest of it sounds like the Beatles. <laughs> Tolkien, of course, breaks into song over and over in his writings. Even the creation of the world is imagined musically, something I suspect Lewis appropriated for himself when writing The Magician's Nephew. All true Catholic literature is hopeful, comic in the older, broader sense. But sometimes Catholics need prophets who will remind us that we are on a pilgrimage. And sometimes they need lovers who will sing to us of a beautiful, sensuous world, redeemed and glorious. All of us at one time or another need both. I don't mean to simplify all this by suggesting that the Catholic imagination of Flannery O'Connor can just be balanced with that of Tolkien, as if we all just need a varied diet. I'll take two helpings of Tolkien with a side of O'Connor, please. These two different ways of writing, of expressing the mysteries of the Catholic faith, are to a certain extent in real tension with one another. One of those tensions that is at the heart of Catholicism itself. As Catholics, we should long for death, since only then will we be with our Savior. But as Catholics, we should long for life, since life is a gift from our Creator to be celebrated to the fullest. Such things are unavoidably mysterious, as well as exhilarating, and they remind us of the varied and powerful ways that Catholic writers, as Pope John Paul said so well, make perceptive and, as far as possible, attractive the world of the spirit, of the invisible, of God. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Han. That was wonderful. Um, we have time for some questions. I'll give you a couple of moments to pose those. Um, if anyone would like to start us off. Uh, my name is Anne. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, in comparing the authorship of both Tolkien and O'Connor, do you think that their uh, life experience uh, was projected into their into their writing? Perhaps um, O'Connor, a young woman with lupus back in the day, not a whole lot of uh, pain management. This young lady had to move back home. Do you see any of uh, that uh, personal experience, and then? Also Tolkien, maybe a happy man with a uh, wife and kids and a good job. And any comments on that? Thank you. I think it would be easy to start by saying that Flannery O'Connor had a life of great suffering. Most of her life was full of suffering. She lost her father when she was young. She was closest to her father. She had a good relationship with her mother, but her father the relationship with her father was a tender and special one that was not there with her mother. And he died when she was a child. Lupus, the lupus was very painful for her for most of her life, starting when she was young until she died. In that way, we might say that O'Connor has suffering very present to her. And so thinking about the relationship between suffering and human life perhaps is always on her mind. Tolkien certainly led, for much of his life, what we might, at least generally speaking, think of as a happy, peaceful life. But Tolkien, who fought in World War I and lost several of his very close friends to the war, uh, whose sons fought in World War II when he was writing Lord of the Rings, 
suffering is perhaps not as immediately and personally present for such a long period of time as it was for O'Connor. But I hesitate to I hesitate to say that Tolkien is less focused on suffering because he led a life with less suffering in it. I think there may be something to that. But the reason the main reason I don't want to let myself go to that conclusion is that I think it gets us off the hook. I don't so much think that O'Connor and Tolkien wrote the way they did primarily because of the kind of suffering and extent of suffering they experienced. I think they both responded to suffering in a different way. I think it's both of these ways are natural ones and good in their own ways. How should I respond to suffering? To look forward to the next life. How should I respond to suffering? To see how many good things remain despite the suffering. Both of those ways, those perspectives, are available to someone who's suffering. So my short answer to you is yes, Certainly, their lives affected the way they thought about their writing, its relationship to their faith. But whatever we say has to go beyond just a reminder of the kind of suffering they experience. I think. Um, you mentioned the like the hopefulness that um, is present in Flannery O'Connor's works um, when understand understood uh, with this kind of um, Catholic, I suppose, understanding. Is there any way that we could see the same kind of trajectory of the narrative um, independent of the Catholic, of this Catholic understanding? Like, could we, um, or is it completely contingent on it? Like, is there any way that we could see this kind of um, hopeful end without it? Let's think just about the river, since that's the story uh, I spoke about. If you have some conception of an afterlife, it doesn't necessarily have to be Catholic. Could be Christian, um, might not even have to be Christian. You could give some account of Harry's death that remained hopeful in some sense. So in that sense, it's not too closely limited it doesn't just have to be Catholicism. If you think there's some afterlife, you can make a case that the story has a happy end. Let's say there's no afterlife, and you still find hopefulness in the story. It's possible, but it's a lot harder. Um, if, you th if you are willing to admit, for example, and, and plenty of non-religious uh, reflective thinkers are happy to admit this, if you're willing to admit that the length of your life is not what matters, what matters is the kind of life you have, however long it might be, then you could make a case that Harry has a kind of happy death. He dies accidentally, but he seems to die at peace. He has a short life. He lives for five or six years. But if length is not what matters most, if what matters most is somehow how the story turns out for you when you do happen to die, then you could make a case that the river has a happy ending. But I do think it's a lot harder. And it's not common. It's not common to think of Flannery O'Connor's stories as happy endings, unless you are taking her faith into account. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, my name is Patrick. Um, Tolkien s basically said that uh, The Lord of the Rings was inherently a Catholic novel. Um, and one of the things that I find very striking is, of course, the fact that he never went into metaphor or allegory in the books at all. And that was a conscious choice, even going so far as to completely hide the divine. You never see Gandalf doing any magic or anything because it was a divine, would be a divine thing. Um, but do you think that in his endeavor to hide that, do you think he accomplished his evangelical goal of trying to spread his Catholic faith to the world? 
That's a great question. There's a very, uh, a book worth reading by a man named Claudio Testi, an Italian, called Pagan Saints in Middle Earth that he wrote a few years ago. Uh, it's not that long, and if those of you interested in this question of the paganism or Catholicism of Tolkien's world, I recommend it to you. I'm convinced by his argument, which makes sense to me of what's happening in, in Tolkien's world. He claims, makes a good case, I think, for the following. Tolkien creates a world that is not yet filled with grace, but open, ready for grace. So Tolkien, for example, does not include in his pagan world, if you want to think of it as a pagan world, things like ritualized nudity, uh, sacrificial killings. There, there's some exceptions to that, but they're always portrayed in a bad light. So the kind of pagan world that Tolkien creates is one that's eminently compatible with Revelation. In that sense, it's Catholic. He's offering the natural world ready, something natural ready to be taken up by grace. But I think that's only sort of half the answer to your question. Uh, if you want to compare Tolkien to someone else who's deeply influenced and is rewriting in certain ways uh, old Norse texts, you should think of Sigrid Unset, the uh, Nobel, Nobel laureate in literature in the 1920s, uh, Norse writer, Norwegian writer. She writes, her, her most famous books that won her the Nobel Prize, Kristen Lavren's Daughter and the Master of Hesvik, and both long epic stories, comparable in size to the Lord of the Rings, actually. Those stories give you a, a pagan world, they're historical fiction, set right around the time of Christianity infusing itself into Norse culture in the Middle Ages. She shows you that Norse world ready for Christianity, and then she shows you how Christianity transcends that world and gives you a new world that we want to be a part of. Tolkien doesn't do that. He only gives you the first part, <laughs> a pagan world ready to be transformed. Why exactly does Tolkien write the way he does and not the way Sigrid Unset does? Sigurd Unset gives us a clearly grace-filled society. Tolkien doesn't. Claudio Tessi uh, doesn't address this question in his book. He talks about the natural, ready for the supernatural, but he doesn't have anything to say about why, why would a, a Catholic writer want to create just a natural world ready for grace and not show us grace. What I'm going to say in answer to this is a bit of speculation. I don't exactly know why Tolkien chose to do it that way. Rather, what was it about um, Sigurd Unset's approach that he found not as attractive for himself? I'll say a few general things. Tolkien loved pagan stories. He loved myths. He loved dragons. Uh, he loved that world, the world of Beowulf, the world of the pre-Christian. He found something in it that expressed the beauty of the natural. And I think for him, that was his access to the divine. He somehow needed that experience of the natural world on its own terms in order to help him turn to the divine. For some people, that's the best entrance to grace, I think. Um, I'll leave it there. You're welcome. say thank you. Um, Catholic artistry is something close to my heart, but also um, something that's kind of come up in my own research is you talk about the kind of contrast between the grotesque of O'Connor and the beauty of Tolkien. Could you almost, not exactly, but loosely map out the difference between like ascensional and incarnational aesthetics onto their two writings? Because we have 
kind of O'Connor and the very ascensional, you know, platonic ascent of the soul where we, we are driven from the material to the immaterial. Whereas with Tolkien, you just mentioned with beauty and that kind of contemplation for its own sake, and especially through kind of the revelation of the incarnation, Christ as mediator, both human and divine, we appreciate it for its own sake rather than for what it directs us to. Sorry, I hope that made sense. I think so. I think so. No good, yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about the prophetic and the incarnational as these two aesthetic categories. I think it's the case that if, if you're a Catholic writer, you've got some of both of those categories, no matter what. So you could talk, I could have talked about O'Connor and emphasized some more incarnational moments. Parker's back if you know that short story, ends up with a very kind of sacramental image towards the end where the flesh of Parker takes on the face of Christ and there's a kind of reenactment of the scourging at the end of that story. So O'Connor's very um, sacramental, a word I didn't use, although I, we could have talked about that as a characteristic of Catholic fiction too. So the incarnational is present for O'Connor. And likewise for Tolkien, who, I mean, back to the first question about suffering, Tolkien throughout his life thought of human life as a kind of long defeat in the world. Uh, human life was full of suffering and it, and it couldn't be avoided. Um, his, his stories were not meant to convince you that, that suffering wasn't sort of present for all of us. So suffering's there for Tolkien too. But when I read Tolkien, when I read O'Connor, I see them as energized most. O'Connor most by this movement to the transcendent. Tolkien just energized by a luxuriating in the creative, his own creative too. As a reflection of God always, but an appreciation of those things that are below him. They do both, but at least that's my reaction. I'd be, if, you're, if you have a different reaction to O'Connor, I'd be interested in talking about it. Thank you for the talk. The question is, to what extent, if any, did Newman's oratorians have on Young Tolkien, his formation, his writing, uh, any yeah, tangible effects? I have only thought a little bit about this connection. I'd like to think more about it. Uh, Tolkien, born in 1893, early 1890s. Newman dies, 1890. He's adopted by an oratorian when he's about 12, early 20th century. The connection in Birmingham, where Newman was, the connection with the oratorians is very close, I think. I haven't found anything where Tolkien talks much about Newman. If you know of anything, I'd be interested in knowing about it. I see the, connect, the connection I'm interested in, and that I don't have much evidence for at the moment, but that I, but that I think is there and that I'm interested in, is Newman's, so Newman moves to Catholicism. Newman's part of the Oxford movement in the 19th century. He's connected aesthetically in certain respects to the pre-Raphaelite movement, to the, to the movement that Tolkien, I think, in certain ways extends. I think you could think of Tolkien as a 20th century pre-Raphaelite. Not a modernist, aesthetically, I think it might be a little awkward to think of O'Connor as a modernist, but she's closer to the modernist tradition than Tolkien is. Tolkien is continuing this tradition of pre-Raphaelite painting where you get this sort of explosion of visual symbolism, color, uh, attachment to Plato. And I think, that's, I think that's part of Newman. I think that's part of the Oratorians. So you get this sort of Catholic aesthetic tradition that Tolkien is a part of, and that I think Newman's a part of too. But I haven't 
I don't have as much evidence for that as I'd like, but I think it's true. I think it's true. I think there's an episode of The Word on Fire where Bishop Barron actually sent somebody to the oratory. To Birmingham? To Birmingham. And it was focusing a bit on like that. Newman and Tolkien. Interesting. Good. I should I should watch that. Is it a recent one? I'm not sure how recent it is. I'll I'll look it up. There's only a few on Tolkien, so <laughs> Bishop Barron's always good. Any questions? Okay. Well, um, thank you very much, Professor Hay, and one more round of applause.